All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good. Welcome, and you may be seated. It is wonderful to gather together with you this morning, this beautiful day God has given us. Amen. As you came in, you should have received a uh, worship folder. If you can take that out now and get that connection card out. Um, each week, there's been like 10 different things. It seems like that connect. it was filled with activities. There's only one. We have a little breather, but there's still a lot of things going on. Make sure you're checking those calendars and knowing how you can be part of our community. Um, we have a wonderful community here of believers, and it is wonderful to be a family together. And I want to thank everybody who came out yesterday and helped. There are 250 chairs that are no longer upstairs. That was a lot of effort, and we want to thank everyone who was here. Thank you. On your connection card, if you can let us know who you are. Are you a first-time guest, a returning guest, a regular attendee? And then if you're interested in baptism, membership, anything that you are thinking about being part of, let us know on that connection card. On the back side, if you can take a moment and let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know how we can lift you up, how we can celebrate with you with praises. We want to be part of it all with you. So as announcements come on, take a moment and fill in those connection cards. Good morning, church. This week's announcements are... Well, hello there, New Life family. I know you're probably disappointed that I'm not in a Halloween costume this year to tell you that on October 23rd, starting at 1030 during worship, we are going to start having our Fall Family Fun Festival with the Trunk or Treat. So the way this is going to work is we're going to have our normal worship service that Sunday. 
Then, starting at around 11.45 or later, whenever service ends, we're going to start the festival. We're going to start the trunk or treat. We're going to have games. We're going to have the screen playing a movie. We'll have the candy guessing game too as well. This is going to be super fun. And if you guys would like to help serve, just go ahead and see me at any time and I will forward you the link. Thank you very much, everybody. This is going to be a blast. As always, we thank you for your tithes and offerings. They can give, be given through the Easy Tithe app or you can text GIVE to 315-325-8080. Or you may place them in the offering plate as it comes around or our offering box is located in the back of the sanctuary. That's all the messages for today. Have a good week. Bye. Let us stand as we enter into a time of prayer and worship. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. We are grateful to be able to set aside all the things that are going on and focus on what is most important, you. Our Creator, our Father, let us focus, lift up, up praise, adoration. Let us worship you. Send your spirit this morning, leading us where you want us to go. We ask this in your name. Amen. Savior's robe as he walks to the room where people pray. We hear praises, he hears faith. There is a sound I love to hear. Sound of the Savior's robe as he walks to the room where people pray. He hears worship, he hears faith.
Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, boy, oh, is my soul. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, boy, oh, is my soul. You are good, good. Oh, 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 let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run.
When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction start to break. To carry there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your shadows burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear is all anxiety. To every soul of captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for the family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, speak the holy name of Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadow. with me. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within his presence. I speak
speak Jesus. We speak your name. We speak your name in our homes. We speak your name in our neighborhoods. We speak your name in our communities, in our work. It is your name that is peace. It is your name, your name. We thank you that we can speak that name, that you are willing to come to us, to come to us so that we could be with you. As your spirit continues to move this morning, we ask that you flow through Pastor Chris, that the words we hear are your words, the words we need to hear so that we can speak Jesus, your light, to those around us. We ask this in your name. Amen. And you may be seated. Today's scripture reading is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this is God's word. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone this morning. Uh, welcome to New Life. Welcome to God's home where we get to worship him and look into his word this morning. Um, Hebrews, as we were looking into this, this uh, book over the last number of weeks, uh, is written to an urban uh, kind of uh, audience, uh, which is important for us to understand. We understand there is a context. Uh, again, it, it's, it's urban. The, the word city is mentioned in it constantly throughout. And as we look into today's passage, what we see is there's a word that I, I don't know about you, but I don't like it. Uh, it's the word patience. Um, and it's written all over the place in there. And what's happening is the folks, uh, they're, they're, they're Jews, they're, they're Christians, Jews, they're completed Jews, and they're being pressured to turn back. They're being pressured to stop becoming a Christian and go back to becoming just a, a Jewish person. So they're in pain. They're under pressure. And Paul, or so don't, I'm not going to go there, but the, the, the author of Hebrews is saying, you need to be patient. God is is working something. And he brings them in this passage here to the story of, of Abraham. And we're going to unpack this idea today because we're semi-urban, suburban people, and I think patience is something that we all struggle with. My, my dad, when I was in college, uh, came to me and he said, um, you know, I looked in your car. I was still living at home. I was going to community college. And he said, um, there's all these fishing rods and a surfboard, but there's not one textbook. And I'm like, this is because they don't teach surfing and fishing in college. And you know, he's like, but where are your textbooks? And I'm like, where they're supposed to be, in the bookstore. And when I need to go there, I pull one out, you know, and he's like, this college thing isn't working. And, and it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't working. School for me, it was, it was just horrific. You know, being dyslexic in the 70s, you know, it was just really, really difficult for me. So he says, what I'd like you to do is, why don't you learn a trade? And I was like, okay. And he said, listen, I can get you an electrical union. I'm like, well, how long is the apprenticeship program? And he's like, five years. I'm like, dad, I'm 18 years old. That's like a quarter of my life. And he's like, hey, maybe you need to still stay in school. It's actually a little bit more than a quarter of your life. And I'm like, five years? That's like an eternity when you're 18. And he's like, I know, but I've been working for over 30 years. To me, at 50 some odd years old, that's a drop in the bucket. That's less than 10% of my life. And I remember him telling me that, like, 
I've been working for over 30 years. I was like, oh. Because I hadn't been working over 30 months. And, you know, and when we're younger, time just seems to drag. And when you get older, what do we all say? Time just seems to fly. And here's a group of people who are very, very new in their faith. They're experiencing pain. And Paul has got to remind them, listen, we're dealing with a God who looks at time differently with us. We're dealing with a God who looks at the end and the beginning. It doesn't, it, 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 he doesn't look at time linear like we do. And because you're very new at this faith thing, trust me who's been around even longer, but more so trust God. That he might not give you exactly what you want now, but he's going to give you what you really need eternally. That was a problem that the Jews had even when Jesus was, came to town. Jesus told me he was the Messiah, he did miracles, but they're like, yeah, but you got to rid us from these Roman situations. And Jesus is like, I don't come to rid you from the Romans, I came to rid you from sin. And they're like, we don't like that. We want the immediate problem fixed first. Romans, get rid of the Romans, then we'll listen to you. He was like, no, I'm not here to give you what you immediately want here to give you what you really eternally need. And Paul is saying, though, I keep saying that, the author of Hebrews, by the way, Paul did not write Hebrews, okay? But the author of Hebrews is saying, be patient. Our faith is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So your first fill in the blank is right here. The promise comes to the patient and the faithful. The promise comes to the patient and the faithful. Christianity is not something that happens immediately overnight. Yes, you, 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 you can go instantaneously, instantaneously from being a non-Christian to a Christian. You can go from darkness into light. That is true. But the faith is compared what, to fruit that grows. It's compared to a garden that grows. It's compared to... Basically, yeast that gets put into you know, a mixture that begins to slowly permeate, or permeate the dough. And we need to understand that our faith is just like that. We need to be patient with it, and inside this patient, be faithful in it. When we look back through the Old Testament, you see, Moses was 40 years off by himself. The Israelites were in the desert for 40 years. The book of Job didn't happen in a weekend. It happened over a long period of time. Even the book of Acts, when I first read it, I thought it happened over a week. No, it happened over 30 years. Paul, when he became a Christian, went off for 11 years. What did he do? Besides drive those around him crazy, he just grew patiently and faithfully in God. And we, on this side of eternity, need to understand that our faith is a journey. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And we need to be patient and faithful. Here's the next fill in the blank. A patient faith is, it's fundamental. It's fundamental. It's needed. You have to have that. And in verse 19, it says something really interesting. It says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. And in order for us to have a patient Faith. In order for us to be faithful in difficult times, Paul, almost said it again, the author of Hebrews says, our soul needs an anchor. An anchor? By the way, every soul, whether it's Christian or not, has an anchor and is seeking an anchor. Most of you know, um, 
to you, I'm Pastor Chris, to other people, I used to be Captain Chris. Sounds like a brand of cereal. But anyway, and Captain, Captain Chris, I used to run a towboat, which is basically like a tow truck, but on the water. And I would get calls for people whose boats broke down on Lake Ontario and Oneida Lake, and I'd have to go pick them up in a boat and drag them back. One Saturday, I got a call from an older couple, and they had a cell phone. And this is a number of years ago, like when they still had those flip phones. And they're trying to talk to me, and I realized they have their phone upside down. And all I'm hearing is like, help, and, and, and so I go, can you turn your phone around? And I hear them, and it's blowing like crazy on Lake Ontario. So I said, okay, where are you? They said, we're, out, we're on our way to Sackett's Harbor. I'm like, okay, that's not too, too far. I can probably get out there. And I had a 30-foot boat all set up to, to tow people, and I went to get out there, and it was really nasty. And I'm like, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to you. And they're like, well, our motor died, and um, they're in a sailboat. And they're like, and it is blowing, and it's like six foot waves out there, which is really nasty. So I go, drop your anchor. And they're like, no, we're, you don't understand. We're blowing. We're healed over. Oh my goodness, we're going to hit the rocks soon. And I go, drop your anchor. And you know, they're like, what? And I'm like, listen, where are you from? They're like, Maryland. I'm like, all right, you're ocean people. You have a lot of road, which is the line that attaches the anchor to the boat. I'm like, you have a lot of road on that. Just make sure it's clear. There's a thing on the front of the boat. It's called a windlass that holds the anchor there. I'm like, hit the switch and hold on. So I can hear them rattling around on there and the wind's blowing like crazy. And they hit the switch. And the anchor went in the water. And it went way, way down. Lake Ontario. You, they were in 150 feet of water. That's like a, that's like a mile and a half offshore. Because every, every mile out is about 100 feet down. It'll go down to 860 feet. But anyway, so it's going down and down and down and down and down and down. And all of a sudden, that anchor grabbed, that road ran out, and that boat turned around. And I said, right up the storm on the hook. That, that sailboat's not going anywhere. As long as your anchor holds, you're fine. And life is full of storms. Life is full of wind. Life is going to push you around. And everyone is looking to be anchored and hold on to something. And once the boat, once the anchor hooked the boat, right it, and they rode the wave out. And they were like, oh, thank you. It's like, didn't they teach you that in boating school? <laughs> but anyway, and after it calmed down, we went up, hooked them up, pulled them in. It was, it, but we all need an anchor because what happens is in this world, there's nothing fully firm to grab onto. And everybody is looking to hold on to something. It's money. It's people. It's a career. It's power position. Everyone is looking for an anchor. And our soul is looking for an anchor. Our soul understands that it is a drift in this world. This life, you are a drift. And we're all looking to be anchored to something. John Wesley writes in his preface to his sermon, uh, The Man of One Book, he says, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. And he realizes that this life is a journey and we are adrift. And how do I get to the shore of heaven? How do I get myself anchored where I know that whatever comes my way be on, held on to something that will hold me sure through it. Now, there's some things that are interesting about an anchor. First of all, we all need this anchor to our soul. Second, the anchor needs to be attached to us. And the old Three Stooges had a skit where, you know, Mo would say to Curly, you know, uh, weigh the anchor. And Curly would say, the anchor weighs 10 pounds, you know, and he, then he throws it overboard and the anchor goes over and the rope goes, and it's not attached to the boat. That anchor doesn't do anything to you because it's not attached to you. And you need to attach. You need to have an anchor that's attached to you, that holds you sure. Heraclitus said what? You can't 
walk into the same river twice. You cannot step into the same river twice. I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you, you can't step into the same day twice. Because everything's changed. I watched the video the other day of a young girl. She was walking across a bridge and she was making a video of herself. And all of a sudden, Putin thought it would be a good idea to send a missile onto that bridge. And it blew up behind her. And her video for me, her showing off her new eye makeup, went from her running for her life from a flaming, flaming ball of fire. That is a quick realization that this life can change in a heartbeat. You could be going to showing your friends on TikTok or whatever your eye makeup to being engulfed in a ball of fire for some madman. And because of that, we know that in our heart. We know that's the way this world is. We're all looking to hold on and to be anchored to something. And whatever that something is, we need to attach ourselves to it. We need to somehow fix ourselves to that anchor. That's why many people get married. I mean, what do we call getting married? Are you going to what? Tie the knot. Are you going to strap on the old ball and chain? Most of us, you know, laugh at everything, but most of us get married because we want to know that there is one person that's never going to leave our side, that's always going to be with us, and is always going to be faithful to us, and is always going to be there. We want something to be consistent. We want something to always be the same. We want an anchor. But we know those things change. We know people pass away. We know feelings change. And we, as Christians, know our soul is looking for an anchor and we must fasten ourselves to an anchor. That's why church membership is important. church commits themselves to you and you commit yourself to the church. It's a way of anchoring yourself. Many people say, oh, I, don't, I, I just want to be free to go wherever I want. Okay. That's okay. But sooner or later, you're going to need some people around you. Sooner or later, you're going to get sick. Sooner or later, you're going to need someone to do your funeral. It'd be nice to know, at least have the person who does it know your name. We need to have an anchor that we're tied to. Next, we need to be an anchor that needs to be attached to something else. You know the towboat story? Um, when you anchor a boat, you always anchor it off the bow. That's the pointy part. The front, you never anchor a stern. The back, the flat piece in the back. I'd gone out, there was a bunch of um, salmon guys fishing. That time of year was, was really good business. And they were out in Lake Ontario. They're from Pennsylvania, so um, tells you a lot there. But anyway, and um, I pull out there to tow them. They broke down. And I get up to the boat, and there's four guys on the boat, and the boat is getting smashed in the back by waves. And they anchored off the stern. So I pull up alongside them, and, and they're getting hit so hard they can't get to the back of the boat. They're screaming at me, throw me a line, throw me a line, throw me a line. And I'm like, nope. Not until you cut that line off. And they're like, what? Now the wind's howling. I'm on a radio talking to them. I'm like, you cut your back, you're anchored wrong. If I anchored to now, if I hold, if I hook up to you, guess what? I'm in the same boat with you are. I'm like, cut that thing off, then I'll throw you a line. And the guy would run up, and they were getting bashed around so bad. He'd run up, and he'd cut the line like this. And he'd cut the line like this. And when that line finally cut through, it sounded like a gun went off. Boom! And off went the boat. And I'm like, all right. I threw him a line. Hook it to the front of your boat. And I towed him on in. And our 
anchor needs to be attached to something. It needs to be attached to the right thing. Hebrews tells us, <laughs> I said it right that time. Hebrews tells us that Jesus went, took our anchor, went through death and hooked it into eternity, hooked it into heaven, and brought us the line back up and said, here, hold on to this. What are you anchored to? Because everyone's anchored to something. What gets you up in bed in the morning? Is it your job? Is it your kids? Is it your 401? What is it? Is it your home? Is it some hobby? What is it? How are you attached to that? Because there's anchors you need to cut loose from. Because they're bad. They're holding you back. And they will destroy you. What are you lashed to? And what is your anchor lashed to? I'm going to tell you something. Health, beauty, it goes. Look at me. I'm a wreck. But anyway. Markets go up and down. Houses burn. It's sold out from under us. People pass away. And Jesus offers us an anchor that's held to God. The only thing that we are promised will never change. And he says, hold on to this. Four years ago, I um, was in a bar. <laughs> I met somebody for, to have dinner with them, and, and there was a, um, a bar associated with it. And when I went to pay the bill, um, I had to pay at the bar. And I'm standing there, and they were showing the rescue of the, the you know, uh, young soccer players who were trapped in that, Thai, that cave in Thailand. And um, the guys at the bar, they were, they were just, they were, they were all like Einstein. You know, most bars are full of people like that, you know. And the guy's like, this is, why don't they pump that water out? And the one guy goes, yeah, I, I pumped my pool out. It took me two days. Why don't they just pump the thing out, you know? And I'm just like, oh, good Lord. You know, yeah, I'm sure they didn't think of that. Let's go down to the Home Depot and get a pump and pump this thing out. They had pumps in there. They were talking like tens of millions of gallons of water, you know, and I'm sure, you know, 17 governments didn't go, let's get a pump, you know, but anyway. So I'm there trying to pay, and I remember listening to him. It said it took them five hours. The divers went, got these kids, and they took a rope line between where the kids were to where freedom was. And they had to get these kids, teach them how to dive. They had to inch along that rope for five hours. That's how I feel. Ay, 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 ay. But I mean, five hours. But if they let go of that rope, and none of them did. Jesus gives us a rope and says, listen, I went through death and I fastened this anchor to God in eternity. Hold on to it. Not just for five hours, but for your whole life. I guarantee you the line won't break. Don't let go. Everything else is going to fail you. Everything will fail you. But this. And the author of Hebrews says, like Abraham, held on to that rope. Held on to that anchor. So here we see having patience in our faith is, is fundamental. Next, next, having patience in our faith is it's feasible, it's practical. We can do this. God said to Abraham, okay, here you are. Listen, what I want you to do is I want you to leave everything. And I want you to wander around. And then I want you to just wait for me to fulfill my promise. He said that to Abraham when he was about 25, uh, 75 years old. The promise didn't come until he was over 100. So he waited at least 25 years. And he held on. 
And God promises us, no matter what comes away, just hold on. Don't let go. It don't, might not look good. But hold on. And he told Abraham, just hang in there. And hold on. Next fill in the blank. A patient faith is functional. And there's several things here that we see that Abraham kind of went through and did and kind of partook of by the grace of God. The first thing is, is that Abraham, he saw God. He saw God. It was in a trance or a dream or something like that. But he says God appeared to him. He appeared to him as this kind of like, you know, when he parts out the animals and there's like a smoking furnace and, you know, and, and he has this feeling of dread that comes over him. But he sees God. And we need to have an encounter with God where we see God. 1 John 3, 2 says, But we will know him that when he appears, we, will, we, shall, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And in our lives, we need to have an encounter with the living God. Or maybe we don't technically see him with our eyes, but we see him with eyes of faith where God reveals himself to us and he begins to work in us. And those are areas that we become like him. If you're struggling in an area of your life, what you don't do is say, I need to knuckle down and fake it like I make it. I need to you know, outwardly ch somehow try to change myself inwardly. It doesn't work that way. That's how religion works. And it will kill you and it will destroy your faith. What you do is you say, God, I need to see you in this. Because it's when we see him is when we become like him. How did Isaiah get changed? Yeah, we know that Cole came off the throne of God. He saw God and he realized he was not like him. And in areas in our life, we need to have an encounter with the Lord. We need to see God in that situation. Disobedience to God? Sin in our life? It's because we're not seeing God in that area of our life. And we need a revelation of who God is. I mean, what changed the Apostle Paul? He was a murderer, by the way. When they killed Stephen, they were like, oh, let's lay his clothes down at Paul's feet. What does that mean? Paul got a new set of clothes? No, they were saying, hey, we did this for you. What changed him? He had an encounter with God. He saw God. And here the horrible murderer was transformed. And we need to have an encounter with God. Maybe we won't see him physically, we we'll see him through eyes of faith. Second is a Abraham saw God, and then Abraham heard God. Scripture tells us faith comes by hearing, and hearing a word from God. You lack faith? Don't sit there, well, I gotta lift, I gotta, I gotta take my faith and, and exercise it. No, you need to hear from God. And God speaks to us through his word. That's why you're here, by the way. It's not to get a bunch of good ideas. It's that maybe through the logos, the written word of God, God will quicken that by the Holy Spirit. It's called a Ramah or a Rhema. And then all of a sudden, it touches your heart. That's why we sing songs. It's not a pep rally. It's a grace rally. Where we're singing something, and because music transcends logic, it goes right into our heart. And it speaks to us. And it changes us. And Abraham, when he was holding on to that line and he's saying, God, I don't think I can hold on to this anchor anymore. I, I'm getting tired. It's been 25 years. My wife thinks I'm nuts. God appears to him and says, hey, take a look at the stars. How about we sit and count them? And he goes, I can't count them. 
And God's like, right, that's what your offspring's going to be like. So hold on. Just hold on. And he did. And if you're wearing thin, your faith seems like it's wearing thin. Your knuckles are raw and your palms are calloused from holding on. You don't need a pair of gloves. You need to hear God's word. So Abraham saw God, Abraham heard God, and then Abraham believed God. God told him something, and he went, okay, you're trustworthy. I can believe you. Why would you lie to me? And by the way, you're a lot smarter than me. If I lied, if you lied, I'd never be able to catch you. And do we believe what God is saying to us? Next is we need to obey. Obedience is not merely a discipline. Obedience, obedience is based in love. It's what do you love more? Your will or God's will? That thing or God? Jesus is not just our Savior. He's our Lord and Savior. People say to me, so Christians about being a Christian, Christian is about obeying God's rules. Not solely, no. So then it's about obeying no rules. No, it's not it either. But if you serve God and he cannot tell you no, he's not God. You are. Obedience is part about being Jesus, the Lord, in your life. And if you don't want to do that, that's up to you. But when we disobey God, we do it to our own peril. And people say, well, you say, well, I'm, I'm, that means I'm going to hell. I don't know. Possibility. Well, why would you want to chance it? And don't you think if God told us to do something, he knows more than we do, and if we didn't do it, our lives wouldn't be as good as if we did do it? And by the way, heaven is about obeying God. It's being with God. Why would you want to go there if you didn't want to listen to what he had to say? If you don't obey God, heaven will be held to you. Abraham obeyed. And he held on to that anchor. And if you're, if you're holding on by a thread, God wants to visit you today. He wants to show you something. He wants to speak to you. He wants to encourage you to believe him. He wants to encourage you and support you to obey him. Because we serve a God like no other God. Because we actually serve God as Christians. And our God went into the grave for us. And then he kicked the back end of the grave out and went into eternity for us. And the way Heaven for us is through the grave. And he fashioned and he put together an anchor for us and he said, hold on. Death for you is not the end. It is the beginning. That's what the word means. It means separation. It means, doesn't mean end. And that's what the gospel gives us that our God did that for us. So at the end of our days, 
we could rest assured that the grave is just the wardrobe we go through into another world that's better than this. We're going to go through difficulties in life. Yes, we will. You're going to go through pain in life. That's promised. But we have an anchor that no matter what we go through, we have a rock, Jesus Christ, who will hold us sure in that. Here's some next steps for this week. This week I'll ask God to forgive me and be Lord of my life. If that's you, please check that. And if you want to talk about it, myself or Pastor Jess or somebody would love to talk to you about it. Or this week, I will ask God, help me to hear your voice. Help me to hear your voice. Make my ear sensitive to your voice. Or this week, I will ask God, show me where I need to obey you. God, reveal yourself to me. Talk to me about me and you. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. Thank you that we serve a living God, not an idol, not some philosophy created by man or demons or, or humans or demons, but one that actually, a God who came to heaven for us. Lord, each of us have chosen one of these next steps this week. I pray that you meet with us, but I pray for anyone here specifically who maybe is holding on by a thread or maybe whose hands are just tired of holding on to that anchor. Or maybe they're just bored, senseless with this faith. They've just had enough. I pray for people who are here today who are just really tired, exhausted, or feel like they're just all by themselves. I pray that you meet them in a very special way. I pray that you'll reveal yourself to them like you did to Abraham, that you'll speak to them, that you'll strengthen them and encourage them, and help them obey you. We pray this in Christ's name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Jess? Ushers, if you can prepare to take the offering, and as we pray over the offering, we are continuing in worship. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us a chance to give back just a little bit that you have blessed us with. We pray that you take these tithes and offerings, that you bless them, that you guide leadership how they are to be used, that it is for your kingdom. We ask this in your name. Amen. Ushers, if you can please take the offering. And as they do, Sherry's going to come up and talk a little bit about this fall family festival. Sherry, what are we doing this year? We're going to have such a good time next Sunday after church. All right? Fall Family Festival. I think everyone's gotten a notification on the sign-up sheet. There's still lots of spots if you want to come and put up, bring your car, open up the back, decorate it with any kind of theme you want, and uh, put candy in it, of course. And we'll have a little trunk or treat for the kids. We're also going to have hot dogs and popcorn machine. You're going to get that going up, um, and drinks, and just a good time. There'll be games. Um, there'll several people will be getting are going to be doing games. And so if there's anything that you're interested in um, helping out with that, uh, we've got somebody cooking the hot dogs, but we need somebody on the popcorn machine and uh, or just opening up your trunk. Whatever you feel comfortable doing, we'd appreciate you stepping up. Um, the other thing I thought of too, maybe you have an opportunity that you've been wanting somebody to come, a neighbor or a family member or a friend, that you would like to invite them to church. This is a perfect opportunity to invite them to church. You can say, hey, we're having church, but then afterwards, something for the kids. So we've got, these are invitations, and I want them all gone by the end of today. So take them to your neighborhoods, whatever you want, because this is opened up to not just church. It's not just for us. It's for our neighbors and our family and our friends to come and something for the kids, and they'll get a chance to hear Pastor Chris. So we hope to see you all next Sunday after church. Thank you, Sherry. And for those of you who are staying after for a growth track, we'll take a short break, grab a little bite to eat, and we'll be meeting in, in the room right there with Pastor Chris. And since I'm talking, I'll just dismiss us. Is that okay? Let us pray, though, as we do, and we leave for this day. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, you have, that we have been able to come to your home today. 
that we have been able to be a family with you, that we have been able to worship, hear your word. We ask that it does not stop here, that it leaves with us so we can speak your name. Let your anchor hold us. We ask this in your name. Amen. And you are dismissed.